If you ask an average wrestling fan what some of the most vivid memories of wrestling are, a lot of them might tell you they come from specialty matches, you know, ladder matches, TLC, Hell in a Cell, War Games. These are just some of the immortal, iconic gimmick matches that we all know and love today. Every booker under the sun has tried to come up with wrestling's next great gimmick match, but not all of them have been able to capture the imagination. This week, I'm going to rank them the top eight worst gimmick matches of all time. First thing, I know a lot of people are going to be asking about this particular match at the comments section, but let me just say for the record, the infamous dog poop match from 1999 was not actually a gimmick match. A lot of people think that this was a match where the person who drove their opponent into a tray of dog crap was declared the winner, but really this is just some wacky build-up to The Rock and the British Bulldogs match at No Mercy later that month. Wait a minute, The Rock and the British Bulldog had a singles feud? <laughs> Poor Rock. Anyway, one night on Raw 99, The Rock gathered some Bulldogs together and told Mankind to collect all their crap onto a platter and bring it to ringside. Later on, the Rock and Sock Connection faced off in a tag team match against Bulldog and Val Venus. Now, no mention of a dog poop stipulation was ever actually made. During the confrontation, the Rock planted the Bulldog into the crap and the match just ended. Not because any gold in that, but because the Rock just didn't want to touch the Bulldog to pin him. So just to clarify, there has never been an official dog poop match. I hope that clears everything up. Oh, wait a minute, I almost forgot. The single greatest call of Michael Cole's career. The dog poop. The dog poop. Anyway, let's begin. Number eight, pole matches. You know, there's nothing inherently wrong with a pole match. I mean, who doesn't love a good old-fashioned coal miner's glove match, am I right? The problem I have with this is I think this stipulation has been, let's just say, it's been abused a lot over the last several years. We've seen contract, paddles, Fuzzy dice, a turkey, a prosthetic leg, a pinata, a bottle of Viagra, Judy Bagwell. When a human being is the prize in a pole match, you know it's time to tear that pole down. Phew, Judy Bagwell in WCW. That right there deserves its own review. Then again, never mind, I don't hate myself that much. Number 7. The San Francisco 49ers Match Speaking of pole matches, this is what happens when you're the booker and your love of that kind of stipulation goes unchecked. This match deserved its own entry. This was a pole match on steroids. Back in October of 2000 on WCW Nitro, Jeff Jarrett and Booker T squared off in a unique match to determine the world championship. The goal was to grab the box that contained the title belt. Whoever extracted the belt from its box was the winner. Now, had pole matches not already been done to death in Vince Russo's WCW, this could have been a really cool match. I mean, think of the possibilities for the kind of different weapons they could have in those other three boxes. Maybe a lead pipe or a chain or brass knuckles. Well, maybe not. The first box, which fell effortlessly to the ground within the first 60 seconds, contained a blow-up doll. Booker T's face tells the story, folks. The action picked up significantly once all the stupid stuff was out of the way. For the time being... Jarrett and Booker T had a good match, so there were some times during his heat where Jarrett could have easily reached up and grabbed the last box. I mean, one went down because of the wind, and the other two came down with no real effort. It would have taken only seconds to grab that belt. You know, between this, David Arquette, Cindy Margolis, Ben Stiller, and Toby Keith, what is it with Jeff Jarrett and his run of bad luck with celebrities? Booker swooped in and grabbed the box of the title belt, which happened to fall out before Booker could grab it. The pinnacle of the sport, people! Number 6. The Scaffold Match Have you ever hated somebody so much you just, just wanted to push them off a narrow walkway suspended several feet above the ground, all while at the same time putting yourself at immense risk of falling as well? Well, me neither. So who thought this was a good idea for a match? The object of a scaffold match is simple. Fight on a scaffold above the ring and keep fighting until your opponent falls to the ground. Meanwhile, you have to work extra hard not to fall off the scaffolding yourself. Sound batshit insane? You bet it is. The scaffold match had its humble beginnings in the early 1970s in Memphis. It's only been used a couple dozen times since then. I imagine a lot of it has to do with the amount of risk involved, but also because it's a super boring match to actually watch live. Wow, he punched him! Oh man, he punched him again! Will the fun ever start? To my knowledge, the last scaffold match done by a major American organization was between Rhino and James Storm in TNA in 2008. But really, it should have been retired in 2001 after this match in XPW. That weapon. Oh no! 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 Please no! Ah! 
Well, folks, shut it down. If that guy's not dead, then wrestling sure as hell is. Number five, the kennel from hell match. There's an old saying in television and movies, never work with animals or children. And even though there were no babies crawling around this match, this was the epitome of that mantra. Back in 1999, the big boss man kidnapped Al Snow's dog Pepper, killed it, and fed it to him. Learn more about it in my first episode of Kayfabe Kitchen. In order to avenge his fallen friend, Snow challenged the boss man to a unique match for the hardcore title, a Kennel from Hell match. A steel cage set up in the ring, and around that was the Hell in a Cell. A pack of rabid dogs would patrol the area between the two cages and tear apart anyone who tried to get through. Except, well, they didn't. No, these dogs were more interested in just sitting around, taking dumps and giving humps. The concept totally fell flat since the big selling point of the match wanted nothing to do with it. Predictably, the kennel match has never been done since then. There's a part of me that likes the concept of a steel cage with a cell around it. I like that element of danger in the match, but there has to be something more dangerous between the two things, like fire or weapons or rabid Donald Trump fans. I mean, anything really. Number four, the bungee match. In 1992, Global Wrestling Federation was home of the first and, to my knowledge, the last bungee jump match in wrestling history. The two combatants were Stephen Dane and Chaz. No, I don't think it was that Chaz. Our boys were suspended nearly 200 feet in the air in a small cage and strapped into harnesses. The wrestler thrown out of the cage would lose the match. They're going at it up there, tooth and nail now. Down, if I could see Chaz pulling the hair, how about that? Wow, look at all that. Action? They could be playing canasta up there for all I know. They're on a small surface, they're too high up for the fans to see, and even if they could see them, it's too dark out. It's everything that sucks about a scaffold match magnified. Even if this dumb idea took off, I wonder how many wrestlers would throw the match. This has to be the one match type where losing is actually more fun than winning. I lost the match, but I don't care! Whee! Number three, the shark cage match. In a match cooked up by someone with way too much time on their hands, Chief J. Strongbow and Bulldog Don Kent fought in an event for big time wrestling in Detroit back in 1977. This match was like a regular cage match, only you have to escape a much smaller cage, one that barely fit one individual comfortably, let alone two. A one fall 60 minute time limit. Holy shit, they let fans believe this match could go on for an hour? I'm surprised this match went long enough for the guy to get that sentence out. Look at this, the cage isn't even locked. The door's popping open during their fight. There's literally nothing stopping one of them from just leaning out of the cage and being declared the winner. So after the worst seven minutes in heaven in history, it took outside interference for Strongbow to be able to escape the dreaded three by three cage and come out the winner. Wow, way to look strong there, Chief. Number two, the lockbox challenge. This match is somewhat similar to an earlier entry in this countdown, but at least Booker T and Jeff Jarrett were actively fighting each other to get to the contents of those boxes. TNA's lockbox challenge managed to amplify all the stupid from that WCW match. On an episode of Impact in April of 2010, there was an eight-woman tag team elimination match. If a woman was pinned, she would leave the ring. The woman who pinned her would win one of four keys to open the lockboxes. Then she would also leave the ring. All right. The four boxes contain the following items. An open contract for any kind of match, Tara's pet tarantula poison, the knockouts championship, and an order to perform a strip tease in the ring. That's right, one box contained the ultimate prize for female wrestlers in TNA, and the other, the ultimate prize for horny, depraved male wrestling fans. For all the crap I've been talking about the Divas Revolution lately, at least they weren't treated like this. The winning ladies were Angelina Love, Velvet Sky, Daphne, and Knockouts champion Tara. Velvet Sky opened her box first. Okay, uh, that sounded really dirty. Anyway, Velvet won the open match contract. Tara's lockbox contained her tarantula, but by reuniting with the creepy crawler, she lost her championship. That's right, folks, a champion lost her title, not by being beaten in the match, but by opening the wrong box. TNA Wrestling, cross the line. It was down to Daphne and Love with the last two boxes. Angelina won the championship in the lamest way possible, meaning Daphne had to strip. Except she didn't because she got beat up by Lacey Von Erich. Boy, a complete destruction of the title's value and a bait and switch. Way to play to your audience. Before we talk about the worst gimmick match of all time, here are some honorable mentions. The Kiss My Ass Match. 
I've expressed my disdain for this match in the past, when Sheamus and Dolph Ziggler fought in that Kiss Me Arse match last year. The Kiss My Foot match is dumb, but at least it's innocent enough of a punishment. The message of humiliation comes across well enough. But to me, the whole concept of a Kiss My Ass match comes off as this dumb way to stir up gay panic among some of the more immature members of a wrestling audience. A pointless evolution to an old school stipulation that isn't that great to begin with. The King of the Road match. WCW Uncensored, 1995. Two guys fighting in a pre-taped match on a flatbag truck full of hay bales? <laughs> Katie, bar the door! In a match that was already severely limited due to the space they were working in, Dustin Rhodes and Blacktop Bully were further hamstrung because the truck they were fighting in was constantly moving, making finding their balance almost impossible. And just to add to its pointlessness, both guys were fired after the match because they bladed, which was a no-no in WCW at the time. Well, money well spent. The King of the Mountain and the Reverse Battle Royal. TNA, sometimes I think you try way too hard just to be different. I mean, hanging something up in a ladder match, fighting to get into the ring and then to get out? Reversing everything doesn't automatically make things better. It didn't improve Diddy Kong Racing's adventure mode, and it sure as hell doesn't make wrestling any more exciting. Makes you wonder what other kind of match concepts were being pitched back when Russo was around. Then the ring's gonna be surrounded by poison ivy, and let me be perfectly clear, the first thing wrestlers are gonna do is find the three Billy Goats gruff and put them back in their cages. But we're not gonna tell them where the goats are. Bro, bro, we're not gonna tell them where the goats are. Then, the first wrestler to leave the arena, get in their car, drive home, and tuck their kids in goodnight is the winner of the match. I swear to God, it's gonna be brilliant where you are going. And the number one worst gimmick match of all time is... The Monster Truck Sumo Match. Hulk Hogan, The Giant, Halloween Havoc 1995, the worst segment on one of the worst pay-per-views in WCW history. Let's do this! Hogan and Giant's feud over the WCW Championship was so big, one match could not contain them. First, they had to settle things in monster trucks. The two trucks meet in the middle of the roof on Kobo Hall, and they start pushing, and 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 pushing the trucks back and forth. It just keeps going on forever, and they're not keeping score. They just keep pushing along until the giant falls off of the ledge of the building and is presumed dead. Wait, what? So after Hogan wins the match by shoving the Giants truck out of the circle, they brawl for a minute and the kayfabe son of Andre plummets off the roof, only to reappear only minutes later in the actual main event for the title. No bumps, no bruises, no explanation as to how he survived the fall. For the complete redundancy of this match, for the amount of time it took up at this wrestling pay-per-view, for the bonkers ending, and for the Giants' complete no-selling of his plummet toward death, and why not, for the Yeti! The Monster Truck Sumo match is my pick for the worst gimmick match of all time. Which matches do you think belong on this list? Let me know in the comments section below. Be sure to thumbs up this video, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, and buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time. Ha ha ha!